I want to base what I'm going to talk to you about over the next 30 minutes on two important key themes and challenges that I'm seeing underpinning a lot of the hot topics in the UK right now in learning and development. The first theme is on the subject of curiosity. Or more importantly, how can we best encourage our learners to use that human trait that we all have called, called curiosity? And then the second thing that I will then turn to is one I think that's already been touched on uh, in previous sessions here. It's about performance improvement or the question or the challenge is, how do we ensure that the learning we provide in our organisations delivers organisational performance improvement? And a lot of the hot topics underpin, sit behind those two themes. Albert Einstein saw this very much in his work at trying to take science forward. And I quote, the important thing is not to stop questioning. Curiosity has its own reason for existence. It's a very human trait and curiosity drives a lot of the, of the furthering of the human race and what we know and what we do. But interestingly, there's a second quote up there, which comes from the middle of the last century, which also recognises the challenge we have when we try and formalise our education, which all of us in this room, in some way, shape or form, are, are trying to do. And I quote, it is a miracle that curiosity has survived, survives formal education. The two things do not always go well together. But what I'm seeing now over in the UK, and I'm sure it is probably the same here, is that there is a bigger recognition about this fact. And a lot of what people are trying to do now in organisational workplace learning is get back to allow the learners to use their natural curiosity. Because I think what microlearning is doing is reminding us of some key important facts about how we structure our learning to make it easy for learners. The first thing that microlearning does do is it does enable um, this, this move to a learning pull culture. Because the learning is now designed as, if I can use the word snackable, easily to digest content that learners can pick and choose what they want to do, it really does strengthen, uh, sorry, it really does enable um, them to drive the uptake and learner exploration. And exploration is behind the concept of curiosity. But it also does other things because it focuses the mind on um, a, a, a common topic probably across many subjects, which is that it is quality that is important, not quantity. And I think for too long now, particularly in the technology-enabled learning space, um, producers of content have hidden behind the volume of content, the bulk of content they create. And what micro-learning does is it forces those same producers, ourselves if we are producers of content, to think a lot more carefully about the quality of what we're creating. It um, doesn't mean that that content, because it's shorter, is less expensive to produce. In fact, quite the reverse. Winston Churchill, as I'm sure you know, is the famous wartime prime minister in the UK, but he's also very known for his powerful speaking and oration. And I quote him by saying, he always said about public speaking, if you want me to speak for two minutes, then it will take me three weeks of preparation. If you want me to speak for 30 minutes, then it will take me a week to prepare. But if you want me to speak for an hour, I'll talk now. Yeah? Now that's the principle we're at. So it's not about saving money moving to microlearning. It's about investing better money in smaller amounts of great content. It focuses our mind on something that sometimes as learning professionals we forget, that it's about keeping things simple. And when we're creating learning content, we should always have in mind one primary learning objective per content piece. And too often, as producers of content, we think we need to build out that content so it's long enough to be a subject worth studying. And that actually dilutes the message we're trying to give. In a personalized learning world, which is now possible because of the use of data analytics and machine learning, learners can now be directed, if you like, 
to only study what they don't know and what they need to know. And all of that extra information, which is not required, can be stripped out of their learning path. And I guess in this field, um, IBM have been one of the leaders in terms of the platforms for some time with Dr. Watson, their artificial intelligence platform. And I am now seeing that being used in the learning field such that effectively Dr. Watson is replacing the LMS. And the learner journey is actually about the learner asking a question of the platform in a box or by voice, and then the platform using the metadata that it holds behind there, and also what other learners that have asked the same or similar questions think, think is useful, and serving up content based on those, those answers. And you know, Teach on Mars's vision, which if I understand correctly, is about making every moment a potential learning moment, is a real key to where the future is going. Our learners out there in the workplace are increasingly short of time to carry out learning. So any learning that they take, they want it to be J3. And by J3, I meant just in time, just enough, and just for me. And I think the themes that we've just been talking about until this point cover those three points. And the next gen platforms are the ones that allow you to bring in different types of learning assets, in introduce social learning and collaborative learning, as well as the concepts of gamification and competition, which have just been spoken about early just now. Also, sitting behind the next gen platforms is often a change in the back end standards and I think I've seen the words mentioned on the slides earlier from Vincent. SCORM has been this standard that has sat behind a lot of technology-based learning for many, many years now. And XAPI or Experience API or the other word Tin Can that is used to describe it has been around now for a number of years, but it is now beginning to take more of a hold in the market. And for those of the, you that aren't from the more of the technology side, the benefit of something like XAPI, stroke tin can, is that you can actually track and record and manage many different forms of learning than the pure e-learning that SCORM was created for. And it really means that in this growing world of the internet of things, any device that is connected to the internet in which one of your learners uses as part of their learning experience, if you wish, could be tracked as part of their learning path. Now, please let me put a point of warning here. I am not suggesting that we, are, we, we track and manage and, and, and look at everything that our learners do. I think there's a place for formal and there's a place for informal learning. But certainly any of you that are dealing with compliance or health and safety areas, then obviously there's a need to track some of that. And that can now be done in many more ways. And I'm seeing we're reaching, we have reached, I would say in the last 12 months, a point of change. And that point of change is that now the new next gen LMSs have become legitimate. Legitimate in the eyes of the corporate, uh, corporate world, the enterprise size world. And the organizations are now seeing, until very recently, if they wanted to go down the uh, next gen route, they'd be looking at an additional investment alongside their traditional LMS. Whereas now they are seeing that they can replace one with the other. And that's happening right now. And I was talking to a, a next gen platform provider only a few months ago, and their comment to me was, now when we're talking to our customers and prospects, or prospects, people who they might want to use their, their, their platform, we no longer have to tell them what we do. That's taken as read, they understand it. We have to just explain how we do it. And they are, they are being invited to, to submit requests for proposals for replacement platforms in enterprise scale businesses. It also links to another hot topic, which is that of performance enablement. The word enablement is normally used with a function like sales enablement. And the difference here, the subtle difference here really, I guess, is that enablement is about empowering people to grow and do their best in their jobs. And enablement, is a wider subject than learning. Enablement involves, yes, looking at what learning people need, but alongside that, checking out managerial effectiveness in that function, as well as how well are their goals aligned 
um, and integrated, as well as what are the recognition, recognition and feedback methods in place and the accountability structure of that organization. In this world, learning is simply one tool that is used to achieve that end goal. And it ensures, more often than not, that there are positive business outcomes. This is creating a shift in the, the roles that learning specialists and the skills that learning specialists working in organizations and in, and in providers of the consulting organizations need to, need to possess. So the learning specialist is increasingly working as a performance and enablement an analyst and working very closely with the business and their business sponsors to identify areas of gap where human performance is causing a problem and then working with other specialists to come up with ways of solving the problem. I was lucky enough to go and see the uh, US learning futurist, I don't know if any of you know Elliot Maisie, um, who, who was over in the, the, the UK about 12 months ago. And I listened to his talk about what he saw as some of the changes and the challenges in, in the learning world. Now this is obviously US centric, so it's across the pond rather than across the channel. But I, there was a lot of similarities with what I've just talked about. He sp spoke about, no longer do our learners need the learning formula that we've been using as learning professionals over many years. And by learning formula, what he meant was the methods that we deliver, the strategies and methods that we deliver learning through. And to, to bring this ho point home, he compared it to the, work, to the way we now consume our music. And I thought this was a really powerful analogy. analogy sorry. He talked about the fact that historically, we would have bought albums of music and we would have been forced to, re to, to listen to that music by that album structure. Nowadays, who here buys albums? We, well, there, there's a gentleman that does, that's all right. <laughs> and Adam. But I'm old. But a lot of us buy, don't buy albums. We download the tracks we want from the internet and we create our own playlists. And his point was, taking that analogy, that our LMSs of today are still providing our, our learners with albums, whereas what they are looking for is the ability to create their own playlists. And he talks about what he called the learning panorama. And by panorama, he was talking about all of the different opportunities for learning that are available now to our, to our learners. And that the role of a learning professional and the, le the role of our platforms is to help those learners use all that material in the, in, in the panorama as they wish to fulfill their needs. <coughs> Help them create their playlists. But he says, move away from the language of school but, and recognise that learning is an active and dynamic process. Let's change our language and that will do a lot to change the culture of learning. He challenged, you know, what do we need to teach our learners anymore? The point he was raising is that actually the, 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 what we need to know in the world now, we don't actually need to memorise. We've, his words are, we've outsourced memorising to technology. And the most powerful piece of outsourcing technology is this smartphone. You know, how many of us remember many telephone numbers anymore? They're all in here when we need them. His, his challenge to us as learning professionals is change what you're, what you're trying to educate your learners in. No longer try and teach them all the knowledge. It's more about giving them the, what he called, navigational memory, where you need to go as a learner, when you need to know something. That's what we need to be, to be educating people on. Now, just reflecting, so I've talked about curiosity, and curiosity is a natural human trait that is driven by human des uh, individual desire, where performance is this deeply embedded organizational psyche. And you might think, well, aren't these two things working in conflict? Aren't they causing a challenge? And I would argue no, they're not, because the role of the learning organization now, and the learning professional, is to try and align the two together. You want to empower your learners to take their curiosity and take them in the right direction, but gently direct them in a way that supports your organization. And in that way, you will awaken the natural curiosity that we all have as individuals to further the performance of your organization. Now, just to end, I just want to talk about a personal reflection. And 
I challenged myself about six, no, 12 months ago now. I wanted to write a blog, an article. And I challenged myself to think personally, go, think over the previous 12 months, where, when have I actually learned something that is important and valuable to me? And I'm not talking about uh, the, the small things in life. I'm talking about the big, important things in life. And I think three things came to me uh, of, of importance about my own learning. One is, don't think that the length of something you learn is actually ever going to be related to the value that it gives you. It's often, believe it or not, the reverse. The small things in life can bring you that, that value that you're looking for in your learning. So that was number one. Number two was, explore every avenue that's open to you as a learner. Don't just take the simple, the structured, the obvious. Explore everything. And the third one is, is something that I think is important in many things in life, and I don't know how well this word translates, I'll explain it, serendipity. Um, the idea that put yourself in enough places where luck comes your way, or turning it to the language of learning, put yourself in enough places that learning will come your way. Let me just leave you with some final thoughts for maybe you to think on yourselves. Hopefully if I've sparked some curiosity in you as an audience. Do you think that curiosity, combined with a performance mindset, can both improve your own world as a learner, but also in the learning that you provide to your people as learning professionals? And would you agree that the actual definition of what we need to provide for our learners is changing? It's now no longer so much about knowledge. It's more about driving the use and development of the available knowledge, rather than memorising what we already could know. And why not remember that it's always worth practising what you preach. Have a think about your own learning habits as learners and see how that, could ch if you challenge that, how that can help you in structuring the learning for your people and your organisation. Thank you for listening to me. I shall just pass back to Adam. <laughs>